fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time, and coming soon. Our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Right. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gents. I'm Vikas Kanduja, consultant orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge, UK, and one of the founders of SICOT Pioneer, and also the president-elect of SICOT. And it is indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you logging into this webinar from all around the world. Now, in the COVID world of non-contact domains, we've certainly embraced digital competitiveness in SICOT with the launch of SICOT Pioneer. And through this platform, we've done over 69 events. And in fact, today's event is the 70th event that we're doing. We've had over 90,000 views from 110 countries around the world. So a big thank you for joining us and following us in this educational venture. Now, today's webinar is focused on segmental fractures of the lower extremity. And we are ever so grateful to the Trauma Committee and their lead, Professor Roman Pfeiffer from Zurich, and Professor Mark Hanschen from Munich for putting this fantastic program together with Stella faculty. Who've given up their precious time actually to join us for this webinar and I'll get Mark and Roman to introduce each one of them to you in a minute. We'll try and make this as interactive as possible. So please do post in your questions. And if you can't join us today, then you can access this webinar on our on-demand platform as well later on. So once again, a big thank you to all of us joining us. Do hope you enjoy the webinar. Please post in your questions, lots of interaction. It should be a good one. Over to you, Mark and Roman. Thank you very much to the faculty as well for joining us. Thank you very much, Ikas, for this introduction and this initial words. So I would like to introduce you our, our uh, faculty. And we have three very, I would say, enthusiastic and really moti motivating speakers. Um, and in the panel today, it's one of the Professor Heholt, so he's from our department and you know, our senior surgeon and big expert in management of lock bone fractures. The second speaker is, is Chris Fang. He's a very enthusiastic and innovative surgeon from Hong Kong. And also I'm very I'm looking forward to see his presentation. And in the end, it's Dr. Davendra. He is, uh, had the possibility to visit his department in, um, in India last year. And I was really impressed by the um, by the concepts they have in management of segmental, segmental defects of the bones, and this had why I asked him to join this uh, webinar as well. And so I'm really looking forward to this meeting. In the end, we have 15 minutes for a discussion. And the first speaker, I would just, uh, let me, I think we start with uh, our presentations now. And the first speaker is Professor Hewitt from Zurich. Thank you very much, Christian. Yeah, welcome everybody. I would like to talk about segmental fracture of the femur is a very interesting topic. 
I will try to focus especially on surgical technique, gives, give you tips and tricks how we solve these problems. And this is the normal setting. It's a complex injury uh, associated with high impact trauma, uh, predominantly a poly trauma setting. So the young male motorbike accident, he presents with these segmental fractures. It is rarely a monotrauma. And the surgical uh, therapy is quite challenging. Be aware that uh, up to 10% of femoral shaft fractures present with an additional proximal uh, fracture. And that is important to remember. So even if you don't find the um, initially the, the proximal fracture, you have to spy for it. You have to look for it. And typically, as you see here in this picture, it's not always as visible as it's shown here. Um, we have open fractures. And these fractures patterns is the shaft fracture and the minimal displaced proximal fracture. That is uh, the, the, the normal configuration, the normal fracture morphology, and very important for the understanding and for the for the for the tactic for the technique is the tokenta bearing fragment. That is the intermittent floating part, as Lynn called it. It's a very unstable situation. We have to address it specifically. Specifically, now we'll come to that. Um, physical examination, of course, of uh, the polytrauma um, assessment according to ATLS guidelines. We perform in these patients a uh, whole body spiral uh, uh, polytrauma scan to detect all injuries. And we also have to anticipate ligamentous injury in up to 40% of patients. It's very difficult to, to assess initially but at the end of the operation, for example, we can do intraoperative testing of the ligamentous stability of the knee joint. It's very, very important. So I come now to the, um, to the uh, strategy and what options do we have? Well, we have damage control orthopedics, and it's always an option. Bridging external fixator, shown here. Place some pins for the proximal fracture and for the shaft component. And within 15 minutes, you have this complex situation, stabilized um, positioning of patient in the ICU and pain control, that's possible. Um, we prefer a staged uh, procedure, especially in polytrauma. And so we do the external fixator for the shaft fracture, for the fract uh, component. And then for the proximal fracture, we do safe definitive surgery. That's a key word that is getting more and more importance. And for that fracture stabilization, we use DHS or lag screws. And then in the interval, after some days, after stabilizing the patient, then we can switch and exchange this ex external fixator to a definitive internal um, osteosynthesis. I will show you in, in a minute. The option number three is all-in-one implant, um, early total care, cephalo medullary nail. That's always an option. It is the question if you want to perform that uh, on the day of, uh, of the injury um, with a polytrauma patient. But let's discuss that. Um, we so see a good indication for all-in-one device, as we call them, for example, the scammer nail, for unstable torrenteric fractures. They are otherwise very difficult to, to, to fix. Or for the sub fracture, it's an ideal indication for all-in-one device. What are the challenges? These fracture reductions are difficult, they are challenging, and the procedure takes long. So early total care for monotrauma, yes, but we would not recommend that for polytrauma treatment on the day of injury, but it's an option. Here are the disadvantages. Um, we can stabilize the proximal fracture, but this intermittent floating fragment is not sufficiently stabilized. So remember, I am nailing is always good for axial stability, but not for rotational stability. The, 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 the nail turns. It turns up to 10 degrees with one locking bolt. So this fracture here in this shaft region, this will switch and turn. And that's why we have here predominantly in this shaft um, um, uh, component, a high rate of non-union. So that is to be kept in mind. Here's a case. I want to see how it uh, is performed. Um, polytrauma, and we have the proximal fracture here and the shaft fracture, by the way, we'd like to position the patient in a lateral position. For us, it's easier to perform this nailing, for, to perform this reduction. Um, and we used here a gamma nail. It looks okay, but if you look critically, 
here's the analysis. Approximately, we have insufficient fracture reduction. We have access, uh, various axis deviation, insufficient interfragmentary contact. And here in mid-shaft, again, this floating fragment, rotationally unstable. And again, a fracture gap here and no interfragmentary compression. It is difficult. And that is the outcome if you use, if you opt for this, um, this, uh, this method. And five months after, um, after stabilization, you have a little bit dynamization, so good fragmentary contact um, because this uh, head screw is dynamizing. That's okay, but the shaft fracture is not healing in a timely fashion. It's delayed healing as expected because of the floating fragment with, uh, without rotational stability. And then finally, after nine months, it's healed, so this... It, it, it went well. And by the way, here, they tried to dynamize this nail and reduced uh, and then um, took out the, the, uh, the, the bolts. Never do that. So if you want to dynamize the, the, the nail, do not take out the interlocking bolts distally because what you, what you create is then rotational instability. You don't want that. So that's not a good, uh, uh, not a good uh, principle. If you want to do early total care, and this is a subtrointeric fracture, if you want to do all in one device and have this fracture pattern, then try to increase rotational st stability of this floating fragment by inserting cables. So, complex fracture pattern, reduce it, cables, uh, wires, then it's all of a sudden a very easy fracture pattern that you can use all in one device and you have rotational stability of all the fracture components. So, it's a good method. Not so sure if I want to do it on, on the day of injury. Again, it's not for polytrauma uh, treatment because this procedure takes some hours in the OR. Individual fixation is another option. You can do antigrade nailing and screw fixation, um, leg screws for the uh, proximal fracture uh, and miss a nail technique. That's possible. But it is not recommended for trochanteric fractures. So if you have a femoral neck fracture, you can do that but not an introhanteric fracture. And again, early total care, it's the question. It may be the discussion for later on if we want to do that. Individual, individual fracture fixation using plates, possibly, um, can be uh, um, performed. Uh, what is not ideal in this pattern here is a fracture a gap, a, a gap between the implants, a kissing implant, and that's a stress riser, so you don't want that. But if you have these specific situations, these are indications for plate fixation in long bone fracture, increased risks of infection, a blunt pulmonary trauma where you say, I anticipate pulmonary uh, um, uh, problems with a uh, reaming. If you have distal amputation, you can use plating and soft tissue damages where basically the um, bone is um, uh, in front of you due to the accident, due to the injury. Our preferred strategy is this, safe definitive surgery on the day of injury for the proximal fracture. That is done within 30 minutes because it's not a big reduction required. It's not technically uh, difficult. And then X fix for the shaft fracture. That is a stage procedure in polytrauma management. The OR time is short and the stage of injury and you have stable fixation and the patient can be positioned on the ACU, ICU, good pain management. And then after some days, you can convert that. And I will show you how we exchange the external fixator and use uh, retrograde IM nailing for the shaft component. We do overlapping imprint, very, very important. And we have a locked fixation because we use a screw and lock the plate of the DHS and the nail by one screw, and here is a miss a nail technique. So this construct is highly stable, and you have all uh, fracture components uh, stabilized. Even this floating fragment is here stabilized with these locking screws, and you have AP locking of the nail. I'll show you in a second. So there's, that is for us the surgical strategy in polytrauma patient management state procedure, and this I am nailing the conversion after some days when the patient is stable. Here in another example, I will show want to show you some techniques. Bilateral femoral shaft fracture, and here this fracture you can easily miss. So look for it. Femoral neck fracture uh, on the left side, and we do external fixator on both sides, and then fixation of the um, trochanteric or lateral femoral neck fracture with the DHS, with or without anti-rotational screw. You can cite that. <clears throat> 
So that is possible. This patient is stable, can go to the ICU. And then after some days, you do the exchange nailing. And I want to show you some steps. So you remove the external fixator. Patient is in supine position. And you do the retrograde IM nailing. You place the guide wire. Look at the bicortical screws now. You exchange them to monocortical screws. You align the interlocking holes of the nail with a uh, plate hole for the DHS. And then you block both implants with this screw. It's a very elegant method. Here you want to try another uh, uh, screw fixation through plate and nail. If that's not possible, do a miss and nail technique as shown here. And you have highly stable, rotational stable situation. And then you can use AP bolts for this nail. So you don't get more stability for this uh, complex fracture. And also sudden the conversion is not so challenging anymore. It's quite, quite okay. And uneventful healing. Um, the rendezvous procedure, as we call it, can also be indicated in these uh, revision surgeries. For example, you have insufficient uh, reduction, and this is not healing. Here is a shear force, here is a gap, and there's a virus deviation. So you want to reduce that, take out the screws, insert a DHS, good alignment, good interfragmentary con uh, compression, and then you block it with the, the retrograde nail. Um, revision surgery for missed proximal fracture, you have antigod nailing, and then you detect this fracture, which is hardly visible here, but it, believe me, it's, uh, it's there. And then you do again, exchange nailing, retrograd IM nailing, um, plate fixation. What I do not like in this criticism here, it's the kissing implants. So you should always overlap them. So this is not a good example. I just, just want to show you overlapping implants, yes, but not kissing implants. Okay, so that was the rendezvous maneuver. We have other segmental fractures, and here is the principle overlapping fracture fixation. Um, anatomic reduction of the metaphyseal fracture, that is often very challenging. It often requires, in, in our view, an open reduction and then internal fixation using auxiliary plate, and then you can do um, any type of nailing, supracondylar nail, or any other implant. So I want to show you step by step. So procedure, monocortical screw fixation of this auxiliary plate. Preserve the nail corridor. Anticipate that where the nail is coming in. Entry point is always critical and important in IM nailing. It's exactly the crossing of the Blumensart line and the anterior cortex. That's the entry point. That's the correct entry point. And then preparation and drilling of IM canal should be very cautious. Nail diameter should be, that's a very key note, canal filling, not overstuffing, not too small diameter. And in Europe, the standard European patient requires 11 to 12 millimeter diameter of the nail. And the nail length should be always going up until the trochanteric region, a long nail until the trochanteric region. And this will apply interlocking uh, screws, uh, preferentially multi multiplanar location, and then you have this auxiliary plate, rotation stability, rotation stability, approximately interlocking bolts. And this is a nice straight um, reduction and highly stable fixation of these implants. Um, I already come to the summary because I want to have some time for discussion. Take home message, stabilization of femur fracture is always an emergency procedure. Do not wait. Patient is extremely, has, suffers extremely from pain, needs to go to the, um, to the OR. Rule out additional proximal fracture, detect them, spy for them, and then the principle of these multi-segmental or multi-level fracture is go from distally to proximally in the stabilization process, use additional stabilization methods, cable plates are ideal, especially for the metaphyseal components, and the rendezvous Maneuver is a nice, nice tool for management of polytrauma patients because you have quick procedure on the day of injury and the conversion in the interval, highly stable fixation and a reduced rate of femoral uh, shaft non-unions. And if you want to use all-in-one, yes, possible, but anticipate long, prolonged um, uh, war time. And then we would recommend to use any additional methods to increase rotational stability of this construct. Nicely, cable, plate, proximal distally, everything is possible at, at the femur. Take-home message two, it's a complex surgery. 
and it's an individual um, decision and it's always an individual operative strategy as shown here. Thank you very much. That's my message. Christian, like always, very impressive talk. And uh, I always learn something from your talks and also doing surgeries with you. Thank um, you. Mark, do you have any questions? Christian, excellent talk. I really liked uh, the multiple cases you presented us. Um, Thank you. And thanks um, to basically show us the difficulties of uh, the entity of this fracture, because we always have uh, mostly young patients, high energy trauma. So the problem is embedded in the polytrauma setting. Yes. Um, Tristan, I have just one question. Your take-home message is it's an individual operative strategy. We do know that different fracture locations do need different um, uh, perfect strategies given by perfect implants in order to, to have um, a very good healing. So the all-in-one technique Sometimes is always uh, um, going in between. You are not um, having the perfect solution, for example, for the femoral neck, but you have the perfect solution for axial stability in the shaft region. Uh, can you can you enlighten us a little bit more how you actually approach and and come up with your individual strategy? Well, I think the combination of DHS for the proximal fracture component and I am nailing in the retrograde fashion is a perfect solution. And I would always go there because all in one is too difficult, too time consuming, not ideal for a day of injury. And the reduction is never perfect. And for me, the perfect anatomic reduction is key for fracture healing. So I never would accept any virus deviation. I would never have any fracture gap and I would never uh, accept uh, rotational instability. And that is the big problem with all in one, all in uh, one device um, uh, fracture stabilization. You always have to make many compromises and compromises are never good. So do perfect fracture reduction and individual step-by-step -step fracture stabilization. And um, DHS is, stable for the uh, proximal uh, component and uh, nail for the shaft component and work with cables and additional plates, then nothing can go wrong. The metaphyseal fracture, you can have always a one try of close reduction. I do not like close reduction because it's always a compromise. It's never perfect for the reduction. And so that's why I would use always um, open reduction for these close to the jo uh, joint lines, proximal distally um, for these factor components. And I just have one more question because um, uh, we still have some time. Um, do these types of fractures change your um, post-operative regimen? So when we do have a femoral neck fracture and use a plain DHS, we have our post-operative regimen um, of partial weight bearing, for example. Um, do the does does the fact of having a segmental fracture significantly change your post-operative uh, uh, follow-up or course of events? A segmental fracture is always more unstable than a normal fracture. The fracture contact is never that perfect, so I would strongly recommend partial weight bearing, whatever that means, twenty to thirty kilograms or half body um, uh, weight bearing on that extremity. Full weight bearing would be for me too risky. Also the immediate um, complications um, after surgery, bleeding, swelling. Um, so partial weight bearing would be recommended in most of these cases, yes. Thanks. Uh, Chris, uh, I'm Chris also. <laughs> nice hey. talk and nice to learn from you. Thank you. Um, it strikes me that in your case series, there's a general preference towards using two implants, which is very good. In our locality, unfortunately, they are withdrawing DHS from the market. It's no longer available. That's that's very sad. 
So younger surgeons, they often prefer to use a cephalomodulary now in one shot. And as you have pointed out, it's really difficult, especially uh, when the fracture is displaced. So um, can you just point out if the fracture is undisplaced, like a very small crack in the proximal region, is it still your choice to use one of these uh, implants? Try to go in one shot. Um, you can do one shot. Again, we have to always remember, I am nailing is perfect for the actual loading, but you have to increase rotational stability. So you have to come up with some measures. And for me, if you want to do, if you have to do a gamma nail implant or civil military nail implant, then stabilize, as I've shown you before, stabilize that mid shaft fracture component with an additional plate, monocortical screws. And then you have open reduction. It's not so ideal, but it's better to have good fracture uh, contact, rotational stability, and then you open up the fracture, and then you can also do the, uh, the IM nailing. Uh, in this case, it's not so challenging anymore. So if you do IM nailing, one shot device, then do uh, additional um, uh, auxiliary plate or cable. That would be my my recommendation, my advice. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christian. Excellent start into this exciting webinar. Um, Thank you. I do not see any more questions in the chat area, and uh, due to time reasons, I would suggest we proceed. And it's my pleasure to introduce. Again, Christian, Christian Fang from Hong Kong, and we'll talk about the entity of segmental fractures of the tibia. Uh, Christian, it's so, your floor. I like to screen share. Thank you. Can you see the slides clearly? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, segmental fractures already highlighted by. Professor here, Hoser, that these are high energy fractures. So again, automatically, it's a polytrauma setting uh, care. So my name is Christian Fang. I'm from Hong Kong. That's my city. That's my hospital. So the outline of my talk, we're talking about segmental tibial fractures, general issues and the difficulties. I'll show you lots of case examples because for these rare situations, it's really hard to get uh, good evidence from the literature about what to do. Again, these are case-by-case case, uh, um, planning, very personalized here. Uh, reduction technique is critical. And of course, we pay attention to the soft tissue. Segmental tibial fractures, it's infrequent, and they are almost always high energy. More than half of them are associated with open fractures, more than 60% polytrauma and the complications rate are very high. Two to nine times more union problems, delayed union or non-union, malunion, double the rate, infection, 22 times. These are high energy. A lot of the time, the segment in the middle is completely stripped off from periosteum. So um, I think in the later talk, um, our next speaker will talk about how to deal with segmental loss, which I will try not to talk about. Compartment syndrome, double the risk. So these are bad fractures. So let's see some examples. You see this fracture here on the x-ray. The patient comes from this situation, crushed uh, industrial vehicle, soft tissue. That's after healing. It's bad. So imagine if you are going to put a plate here. This is very challenging for the uh, thin tibial tissue. The beauty now is we have these advanced implants, nails with a lot of expanded locking options and these are soft tissue friendly so patients in generally if the technique is good they do well early after surgery and the soft tissue is well preserved this follows very well the principle of fracture fixation where fracture biology is very critical the main challenge of dealing with these fractures is firstly we are dealing with a shaft fracture a mid shaft fracture is usually easy to deal with, but at the same time, there is a metaphyseal area and that creates problem. The metaphyseal fragment often invites problems of 
metal reduction. Like in this case, there's a varus and also a procravatum deformity. So how to avoid these trouble? If we look at the literature, we look at in general, when we fix tibial fractures, plating, there is a um, higher risk of infection, but in general, male union, delayed union is very low. And when we move on to nailing, the risk of male union is higher, but the total risk of infection is usually lower. And this is compared to the old days of casting infection is uh, as much less. So we are staying here. Uh, nailing techniques, we want to be an expert and reduce our uh, number of complications. So segmental fractures come in different flavors. So this is a rather simple one. You see a mid-shaft uh, wedge fracture, and you're going to nail it. But a lot of time when you look closely, look very closely here, you do see undisplaced segmental fractures where you have often missed. So the pitfall number one is not to miss these fractures. Pay close attention to the x-ray. But again, the most straightforward of these types would be the segments that are confined to the mid shaft. So for these, I would say that they are rather straightforward. You put it in an iron nail, and it would automatically reduce uh, both fractures. The other uh, variant would be where there is a very uh, near the joint metaphyseal fragment where it's undisplaced. And usually doctors would prefer to uh, use a plate fixation for these because the reduction is rather straightforward and the risk of intraoperative uh, fracture displacement is lower. Mind you that uh, plate fixation of course, requires a um, good soft tissue status. That's another example here, a mid-shaft fracture that looks rather straightforward, but there is a proximal fragment, which in the case of when putting in an I IM nail, um, the surgeon must have techniques to prevent this from uh, displacement. Okay, so this is often the scenario where it invites trouble. Like for this example, a patient with very similar configuration, mid-shaft displaced fracture, proximal, relatively undisplaced, you would be tempted to put in an IM nail like that. But the trouble is oftenly known, proximal fractures, they're prone to procravatum as well as valgus deformity. So looking into more detail into this case, how would you have prevented a valgus? So I think number one trick is the surgeon could have fix the fibula first before going to the tibia, that may have prevented a little bit of the valgus. And secondly, as shown here uh, in the revision situation, use a small reduction plate to uh, stabilize the proximal fracture. So these are techniques. Um, our implants are much better than the old days 20 years ago, more locking options, both distally and proximally. Um, so these kinds of segmental fracture, if done correctly, would end up with good overall reduction. So the uh, key point is to pay attention to the proximal um, segment, so parallel knee joint to the parallel ankle joint. And in the mid-segment, preserve the soft tissue, um, have the correct length, have correct rotational alignment. These are general basic principles of uh, fracture treatment in high energy fractures. Uh, intraoperatively, these tools are extremely useful. A femoral distractor, even though its name is called the femoral distractor, I often use it for the tibia more than the femur. Our cutaneous uh, bone clips for uh, distal metadiaphyseal oblique or wedge fractures are very helpful in uh, having minimal invasive reductions. The, um, screw blocking screw technique originally described here by um, pretech of course polar um, and then um, these are extremely commonly used in situations of segmental fractures mind you that the description in the original publication um, he used a very short threaded uh, drill bit instead of our usual drill bit or you can also use a uh, thick guide wire for that purpose, which is less easy to break uh, when putting in the polar screw. Newer implants, such as the uh, suprapatella nailing implant, is preferred by some, but in my population, 
I usually don't uh, go for this because our patient size in Hong Kong are rather small. So needing to jam in this um, this uh, cannula is sometimes too tight for our patients, especially for those with osteoarthritis. Newer um, design implants. This is a new uh, locking nail from Synthes. Allows us to have these uh, locking cannulas that is really rotated and jammed into the the, uh, lock, the the aiming device. And this can exert pressure onto the fragment and provide some degree of um, uh, reduction control. So I think these are very useful tools. Um, the very traditional technique, remember in a distal fragment, especially the location where the guide wire ends is critical. The guide wire should be always slightly more lateral so it's not in the dead center, but slightly more lateral. And these guiding tools, um, it's a sloped um, cannulated um, T-handle hollow inserter that will let us place the uh, guide wire very accurately within the canal. So it comes in two different designs. One is a slight slope. The other one is this rather um, extended curvature for patients with a larger intramedullary canal. And here is a guide wire placed correctly. So this is in the lateral one-third of the uh, distal tibia. Lateral. That's where we always aim for. As well as if you look at the um, the lateral view of the ankle joint, the guide wire should always end up slightly anterior, around two-fifths anterior uh, relative to the uh, distal metaphyseal uh, cross-section. In the old days, um, my senior would use this tibial alignment template uh, layered onto the x-ray to uh, look for reduction. The key is the knee joint should be roughly parallel as to the ankle joint. So in order to assure there is no varus or valgus um, no reduction. So we look at some more cases. These are rather straightforward, highly osteoporotic fractures. Look at the IM canal, it's very large. So um, the surgeon may avoid using an IM nail. And for me, it's rather straightforward. We put in a uh, locking plate percutaneously. So these are because low energy uh, patients, usually the soft tissue situation is relatively well preserved. Another example, a rather in this place, we still call this a segmental fracture um, fixed by a plate. So if it's high up, we treat it like a tibial plateau uh, by condylar plating followed by early weight-bearing marking. This is in an elderly patient, mind you. Elderly patients, they usually do not know how and cannot follow the command if you ask them to uh, do a protected weight-bearing uh, walk-in. This had been studied before. Uh, so we go back to these cases, um, typical um segmental fractures. So it can be managed this way. If the soft tissue allows, uh, I think a plating technique is technically easier for the reduction. Um, as you can see here, good reduction. Um, another example, um, so using multiple plates for distal segment and the proximal. This is like fixing a, a plateau plus a separated metaphyseal Fracture. But the problem is why we always want to avoid plates uh, nowadays is this prominent uh, soft tissue problem. And there is evidence to show that plating really has a higher rate of uh, wound breakdown infection. Therefore, if technically feasible, nail should be the to-go uh, implant. An example here, a mid-segment that's highly comminuted. So the key is to... Uh, get the correct entry point and the correct distal uh, site for the guide pin where the nail is inserted. And the mid-segment, we can really, uh, we don't need a perfect reduction usually. That's to preserve the soft, soft tissue situation. But in this uh, particular cases, um, I think at around three to six months time, the healing is a little bit delayed. So uh, augmentation plate was placed in to improve the stability and therefore fracture healing later. So you can wait for the soft tissue to recover a little bit before uh, putting in the plate. Okay, so it always invites question, when should we 
fix the fibula. I think the fibula is a very useful reduction tool. You can see this as. So in this situation, it's very difficult to reduce the tibia alone. But the fibula is a rather simple fracture. So one can put in a very simple uh, intramedullary K wire, make sure the length of the fibula is correct. The, this brings you back to the tibia. So start with the fibula, move to the tibia, and that helps the reduction. Another example here. So it's hard to get the length correct in the tibia. So in some situations, now be careful of the peroneal nerve, of course, plating or, or stabilizing the fibula will help in reduction of the uh, tibia, like in this example. We do not want to uh, go for direct reduction in these uh, segmental fragments, which are devitalized and may be prone to infection. So the difficulty always comes how to maintain the alignment. Lengthwise, you can use the fibula as a guide, but the problem always is rotation. And rotation is a very subtle thing that um, you may not notice during surgery. So this is a patient who had jumped from height and again, segmental fracture, um, lost of any reduction clue because there is no fragments. It looks okay in the initial fixation after a plate. But when we examine the patient, she is like this, this kind of out-towing malrotation, and it commonly leads to in-towing uh, knee pain because of the posture. So in the, when down, I think um, draping both legs, so one can examine clinically the uh, rotational alignment uh, really helps. And for this situation, we had to come back uh, for osteotomy, uh, the rotation, Mind you that in the rotation osteotomy, the trick is to put in two K wires, have a CT scan, know the exact amount of correction needed, and look at the two K wires um, to gain the correction of uh, rotation. So a little bit on soft tissue, I find this tool very useful. This is coming to the last part of my talk. This is the endocyanin green uh, capillary angiography. I know general surgeons, plastic surgeons does it a lot, but orthopedic surgeons, we, we are not very familiar with this. So around one or two years ago, uh, I've been starting to use this. So it, it gives you a light source of a particular uh, wavelength. And this is endocyanin green dye. When injected to the body, it creates a fluorescent. It absorbs a light source and gives out a light of specific uh, wavelength. So, for example, in this kind of uh, bad soft tissue situation, you are doubtful whether or not to excise the soft tissue or preserve it or wait for a while and come back for skin graft. So doing this uh, in the sign and green uh, in geography, we can point this uh, special scanner at the patient, at the same time inject the dye into the patients, and it would show up this kind of uh, fluorescence uh, and you can see here in the foot, this region here, it's uh, not lighting up. The region surrounding has this hypervascularity that is white. So we know there is a blood supply here. Uh, so we look at this. So once we inject the dye to the patient, the, uh, the skin would really light up like this. And you can use a marker pen to uh, go around. So I think this is relevant for... Uh, high energy trauma in the lower limb. That's why I want to show this. Uh, and then we could decide to debride this uh, region, put on a skin graft. So that's how it looked like. It looks like when you inject the dye uh, after a few minutes, you see, and the, uh, the area without blood supply. And this is very early on, only one or two days after the injury, after the debridement. You can look at the patient's face here. So it really tells you and differentiates clearly where is blood supply, where is the tissue without blood supply. You can use it in uh, sequestrum. So this is a sequestrum uh, from thermal injury that you can excise and cure touch out. So um, this case, I think, um, is, a, is a segmental fracture by definition, but really it's a stress fracture here. It's a stress fracture because of long-standing deformity of the lower limb. The patient has a childhood injury. We still call, call this a segmental fracture. But in this situation, it's different. It's not high energy. 
So for this case, we have a specially de designed 3D printed and 3D planned uh, reduction tool that we would put in Shan screw, do the osteotomy and bring it back into the uh, correct alignment and fix by now. The, the highlight point here is you see the use of uh, polar screws. So even in this uh, undisplaced kind of proximal uh, uh, stress fracture, there is this proneness for once you put in the eye nail to displace the fracture. So I think that applies to uh, all the situation of a metaphyseal proximal femur fracture. So you see the use of two polar screws, one over here, one over there, to, uh, to have a good reduction. Uh, no rotation, no deformity. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, nails are the primary choice for management in this uh, situation, mainly because of soft tissue concern. Alignment is uh, very difficult highly technical um, so we have to use polar screws traction device a lot of reduction techniques uh, mid pole plating when the soft tissue allows is technically easier um, again soft tissue soft tissue that's the key point so i would finish my talk here thank you very much thank you very much chris like mentioned before i like your innovative thinking it's uh i learned it many many times speaking with you you're your ideas and how you use it in, in, in your daily life. It was impressive that uh, perfusion te techniques uh, or perfusion analyze, analyzing techniques that you showed before, it was very good. So any questions from our team, our faculty? Yeah. So uh, I have a question, Christian. Yes. Yeah, it was a very nice talk, uh, very illustrative uh, examples. I would like to ask you about this. Uh, when you have a proximal tibial fractures, how often do you choose a suprapatellar nail compared to infrapatellar nail? What is your take on? Uh, so I think if I live in Europe or USA, I would almost always use a suprapatellar now because the patient size are bigger. But in my okay. locality, we are very limited because the um, the sheath that we have to put into the knee is really too large. It does not fit our uh, Asian smaller size population. Uh, I have seen very good results from other speakers, but from myself, I would still use the infra uh, patella nail. But then the reduction is much more difficult, much more technical. Uh, I think, Christian, uh, <laughs> you can also tell us, is it your preference to use supra patella nails now? Nowadays. My question is, how often do you use a suprapatellar nail, especially in proximal tibial fractures? And what is the indication of, uh, what is the, do you use a suprapatellar nail for distal tibial fractures also? Because oh, the reduction as, is easy. As I mentioned, it's very rare, rarely used very because rare. we're limited okay. by our body size. Uh, I think less okay. than one in 10 cases that I use them. So I'm in Europe, I'm in Europe, but I do not use the <laughs> supracondylar nail. I do not like it. It's a difficult technique. Now you have two techniques you need to master. Stay with one technique, you, you know, and that is for me the infrapatellar nail and mm -hmm. use some reduction tools. I like personally, if you have a proximal uh, fracture component, use a small plate. Go to the anterolateral cortex of the tibia. Make a small incision there, put that plate on, there's a very strong anterolateral cortex. Use monocortical screws. Then this fracture is reduced. It's no problem. And do the nailing, no problem. That would be my solution. I would agree with that completely. The suprapatellar nail does not solve the problem of a procrevatum valgus, um, but the reduction plate does. <laughs> yeah. Well, for a short question here from the, from the audience, from our chat. So one uh, participant asks, how, how do you, or do you use sometimes traction tables? So it's probably for both from femur and tibia. And how do you avoid the risk of devascularization due to reaming for nailing? So is there any techniques to avoid devascularization? I, I would answer the reaming thing first. I think it's important that we have an open fracture. We see the middle segment, especially. Is commonly stripped off uh, from soft some from soft tissue, so that is the situation where you want to consider using an unreamed tibial nail. So excellent question, um, but rarely um, does that happen because an unreamed nail 
it's really some compromising on the mechanical stability there. Uh, that's the uh, answer to this question. Traction table, I think uh, for femur, I use it all the time. But for tibia, I rarely use it. That's personal preference. I rather use the uh, femoral, femoral distractor device for the tibia. My answer would be, I don't see the problem of uh, necrosis. But, uh, during the reaming process, you do a limited reaming, higher refs, low pressure when performing the reaming. And if you think of a tibia nail, it's typically 10 millimeters over ream plus one. So I don't see the big problem of uh, uh, necrosis of bone necrosis. That was historically when we did reaming up to 15, 60 millimeters for the, um, um, for the nails, but um, I would not do that anymore. So no problem. Traction table, I do not like it personally. If you have enough manpower, it is easier to not use it fracture table because then the reduction of the fracture components is easier otherwise you tension the muscles of the soft tissues and by that the reduction of the fracture is more difficult unreamed nailing i caution you to do that you have one shot and it's so difficult to find the entry point and the end point especially the end point in unreamed nailing and then you have virus and valgus deviation. Do not do it. It's safer to do place the guide wire in the perfect position, the end point, use time, over ream, introduce the nail, no problem. Thank you very much. We, uh, we move on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Devendra from, uh, from India, Combator. So I'm looking forward for your presentation and your concepts. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Roman, for the invitation. I'm going to talk about the management of segmental bone defects in uh, open distal femoral fractures. If you look at the bone defects, it can be either primary or secondary. The primary bone defects occur at the time of injury when the motor vehicle accident happened. The moving object, when it hits the other the person who is sitting with the knee inflection, the initial injury makes the fracture to occur at the supracondylar level. And when the violence continues, there is one more fracture at the above. And when the violence continues, the, uh, the force ejects the whole segment of uh, bone through the small wound. The wound can be either through the patella or just above the patella. The wounds can be very small, but the defense defects can be very high. This is how the uh, long bone segments happen like we see on the x-ray on the left side. So the, this kind of massive bone defects, it is a major reconstructive challenge to anybody. The common options that we have is uh, the bone transport technique and free vascular fibula, induced membrane technique and modified capena technique, which is described in the recent, uh, in the recent times. The, coming to the bone transport, it is a versatile technique which can be used by any surgeon. It can it is advantageous uh, it is uh, to use in the metaphyseal as well as uh, diaphyseal bone defects. It it, uh, it corrects the angular deformities also. However, uh, the disadvantage is that it is it has got a poor patient compliance, especially with the uh, ring fixators. It it needs multiple surgical procedures and uh, prolonged treatment. Pin tract infections are possible, and when the pins near to the joint, if they get infected. Septic arthritis can be a problem resulting in poor uh, outcome, which may end up in secondary amputations. Coming to the free vascularized fibula, free vascularized fibula graft is advantageous uh, in long bone defects up to 20 centimeters. It is a vascularized viable autogenous graft, which uh, has structural strength. The disadvantage is being, it is a very complex surgical procedure. There is a risk of failure of anastomosis. There is a mismatch in sizes compared when we use, especially in the femoral bone defects. Uh, we might need to use a double barrel uh, fibula and it may be difficult to use in long bone defects and it needs prolonged protection to prevent uh, refractures. And there is a problem that it can get infected and uh, failure to unite also is a problem. Induced membrane technique, it, it is a two-staged uh, a technique where initially the bone debridement is done 
followed by uh, filling up the defect with the bone cement and uh, waiting for a six weeks period and then uh, we need to intervene again to do a bone grafting of the whole defect which helps us to achieve the bone union the disadvantage being it is a, uh, it involves two surgical procedures and there is a availability of the autograft is also limited and there is a it is involved with a huge donor site morbidity as well here is a patient who had a open floating knee injuries uh, had a cement spacer for the bone defect and we can see that uh, after 6 weeks time we have uh, we have added an addi additional plate and then bone grafting and it went on to heal without any much problems at the end of 20 months here is one more uh, young individual who had a major crush injury of the left lower limb and it involved a long segment of uh, bone defect uh, around 7 centimeters of uh, bone defect and with ganga hospital open injury severity score falling less than 14 uh, it is a case for salvage so we went on to salvage this limb by uh, initial external fixator followed by cement placement and then uh, a long uh, large ALD flap was done and after six weeks time once the flap has healed the cement was taken out and then uh, uh, cancellous bone, bone grafts were added to the defect and it went on to heal without any problems However, uh, cementing in cement placement, a masculine technique is quite popular in uh, infective cases. Uh, it is not so well used in uh, primary setting with the open injury fractures. This patient went on to have good outcome without any much problems. Coming to the allografts, we have seen the advantages of bone transport, free vascular fibula graft and induced membrane technique. Now let us see whether the allograft are, uh, have got a good advantage in managing the, these kind of uh, bone defects. The allograft is the technique involves the choosing the correct size allograft to the defect. We have to reshape it and then place tricortical uh, iliac crest graft and a lot of cancellous grafts uh, can be added throughout the length of the iliac, uh, allograft and uh, it is fit to the shape uh, shape of the defect and then stabilized with the locking plate. And we have used this technique uh, up to 2018 uh, in 20 patients. And uh, we had a, a very good results in these patients. The average defect was about uh, uh, 10 cent more than 10 centimeters. And most of them had a plate fixation. Our source of uh, uh, allografts is mainly from the uh, structural grafts, which are harvested from the amputated limbs. So we can see that the, uh, the time to union is around six months, maximum up to 10 months. And we had a reasonably good range of movements. The advantage is that here it is a single surgical procedure, which involves, uh, uh, which helps us to achieve good knee range of movements and good outcome also. Uh, uh, let us see some of the case scenarios. Here is a patient, 53 years old gentleman who had a open uh, wound around just above the patella. We can see that the wound is quite small. However, the defect is quite large. So, the, uh, as, I, as I described earlier, when the knee is in flexion, the whole segment gets ejected out uh, at the time of injury. So, uh, these kind of major injuries, uh, we need to give a good resuscitation. Uh, initial damage control surgical procedures are done. And once the patient is fit, once we re uh, resuscitate them well and the lactate level becomes normal, less than 2 millimoles per liter, then we can go for uh, uh, reconstructive procedures. Here, uh, this is the uh, external fixator picture. And uh, we can see that up to 9 centimeters bone defect is there in the uh, segmental bone defect. And we have taken a, a similar sized uh, distal femoral allograft and then shaped to, the, to fit into the defect. And the whole intramedullary canal of the allograft is reamed, prepared, and then cancellous grafts are placed, which are harvested from the iliac crest and uh, it is filled completely and then fill, fit it into the defect and this is how it has been plated. We can see that the whole defect is fit proximally and distally. It is important to have good bony contact so that the uh, healing happens by contact healing. We can see that at the end of three years, uh, it is completely consolidated without any problems and uh, we can see that he has got a very good range of movements. He is walking independently without any problems. And uh, here the advantage is that with a single surgical procedure, we achieved 
uh, complete union both distally and proximally we, and in in terms it is a very cost effective procedure when compared to multiple surgical procedures which again cost more so here is a, a young individual 40 years old gentleman who had distal femoral fracture with a bone loss segmental intercalary bone defect and also in addition to that there is a proximal femoral fracture so he, uh, he also falls into the uh, category of salvage zone according to ganga hospital open injury severity score and uh, what we did was uh, we initially reduced the subtrochanteric fracture open adduction and then uh, we have planned for intramedullary nail from prox uh, proximal femoral nail which goes up to the distal femur and the whole defect is filled with the structural graft this uh, this is the uh, allograft that we have chosen we have sh shaped it uh, so that it fits into the defect and then intramedullary uh, ilicus grafts were placed and then uh, temporarily we have stabilized the graft to the distal femur with uh, small pins and then uh, nail was passed proximally since uh, it is not very stable fixation if we choose only nailing we have added a plate from distally to the proximally and uh, this uh, this is how it has been plated we can see that the anteriorly there is a small soft tissue defect and which required a small uh, grafting and uh, this is the immediate post op x ray and four years later we can see that without any requirement of further secondary pro bony procedures whole allograft is incorporated with the native bone both proximally and distally and good uh, union has uh, occurred and he is he has got a very good range of movements both uh, knee knee flexion and he is able to walk independently without any problems here we have achieved this outcome without any further secondary procedures the, that is the advantage of the allograft with these kind of problems so, uh, we did have some complications like uh, superficial surgical site infection in one patient uh, requiring only antibiotics and deep surgical site infections were there in two patients both were elderly patients and uh, one patient required an amputation and other patient required uh, one another surgical procedure to achieve union so here is a gentleman uh, we, who had a 16 cm bone defect and uh, here instead of placing the iliac crest grafts into the medullary canal of the all allograft we have placed a, a free fibula uh, free vascularized fibula graft here it is harvested uh, with a small skin island which the skin island uses it tells us whether the free phase free vascularized fibula graft is viable or not once the surgical procedure is over in the subsequent follow up days so uh, there is a uh, it is prepared accordingly and then it is the whole fibula is pushed into the allograft and then this is how it is been fixed for this patient the whole defect is filled with the uh, uh, allograft uh, here the advantage is that allograft gives the structural support and the vascularized graft gives the biology for the fracture to unite so this we can see that both proximally and distally without any requirement of further surgical procedures it has completely united without any problems so and the advantage is that he has got a good range of movements and here we could mobilize the knee joint early because it is a single stage procedure so the either we can use iliac crest graft our uh, hospital protocol is if the bone graft bone defect is up to 10 cm we use a uh, long structural structural ilac uh, allograft along with ilac crest graft if the defect is more we choose free fibula instead of ilac crest grafts alone so that uh, the revascularization is better in the long segment bone defects we can see that on the lateral side of the thigh the skin island is still viable which tells us that uh, it is uh, the free fibula inside is viable and in, in the immediate post op days it is very useful the skin island so that uh, we can identify whether the free vascularized fibula is uh, getting revascularized or not so uh, this modified this is called modified kepana technique this technique of uh, long structural allograft with the free vascularized fibula graft is been described uh, to use in bone defects from rizzoli institute uh, italy and uh, this technique we have modif modified it to use in uh, uh, open injury patients also the disadvantage is, is that it needs a microsurgical expertise it it has uh, it involves prolonged duration compared to ilac crest grafts so to conclude uh, 
it is a major challenge to treat this kind of massive bone defects many times we end up in primary amputation and if attempted for salvage there is a chance that we end up in poor results and again secondary amputations so it is important for us to select the patient very carefully which suits uh, for the pa- uh, which for this kind of technique so the advantage of the allograft is that we can mobilize the knee joint very early we can uh, allow them to weight bear uh, quite fast so that the union happens disuse osteoporosis doesn't occur like we see in other uh, techniques where prolonged immobilization leading to disuse osteoporosis and then uh, further poor results it is a single stage reconstructive procedure which helps us uh, to achieve good outcome and it is cost effective compared to doing multiple procedures which involves m- uh, multiple times cost for the surgical procedures and uh, these are gamma radiated allografts these are processed thoroughly cleaned and then gamma radiated so that uh, they are very safe to use clinically and it has got very less donor side morbidity thank you for your kind attention so oh, thank you very much uh for this very impressive talk and this uh, this yeah very interesting uh, techniques to fix uh, segmental defects mark do you have any comments points um thanks so much excellent talk i really enjoyed uh learning about uh, the different techniques um I've got one question uh, concerning the role of scaffolds, off-the-shelf products which um, are available to actually fill in um, gaps. Do you use scaffolds? Uh, Scaffolds means like a tricalcium phosphate granules or something like that. Uh, We routinely don't use uh, in our hospital uh, this artificial uh, scaffolds. to fill the defect if uh, as i showed earlier if there is a uh, if there is a segmental defect we straight away if it is in tibia we go for a bone transport if it is a femur we always choose uh, allograft and if there is any uh, unicortical bone defect if you don't want to do immediate bone grafting we place the bone cement so that it maintains the space and it may, uh, once the uh, wound healing occurs after 6 weeks time we remove the bone uh, cement and then uh, place electric graft we routinely don't use uh, scaffolds perfect thanks so much there's a question from um, from the audience a question probably to all speakers how would you compare distal femoral fracture fractures treated with locking plate versus retrograde nailing in your personal experience so what would you rather do retrograde nailing or distal femoral fracture uh, fixation with a plate yeah yeah retrograde nail is still uh, very much valid in uh, distal femoral fractures especially in extraarticular fractures if there is an intraarticular extension it is always better to choose a locking plate if there uh, because we can uh, uh, blow out the medullar intra- uh, distal femur uh, segment by passing the nail so extraarticular distal femoral fractures always there is a role for uh, retrograde nail rather than choosing uh, locking plate it is more stable in extraarticular distal femoral fractures what is your uh, opinion roman yeah I, i agree plate should be the standard for uh, distal femoral fractures i mean when it's metaphyseal or lower down because it's mechanically more stable however we should look out uh, for the new products there is a product coming out that's a nail that comes with a side it's it's a they call it a washer but it's actually a plate that has locking screw that go into the nail and the washer itself has multiple additional locking screws that you can either put laterally or medially so i think um, the americans are using this uh, quite frequently we recently have this product we tried a few cases so it's good to look out for this product uh, it's soft tissue friendly but technically more demanding yeah i think it has to be used along with in association with the nail on the medial side two screws goes through the nail and two screws goes into the distal 
medial femoral condyle. It is called locking attachment washer. You have it in your hospital. No, it is not yet launched in India. Mm. Yeah, we are also uh, trying that. Uh, in Europe, Christian, is it available? The locking attachment washer. Oh, sorry, you're muted. It's coming up on the market. I've not used it, but I've seen it already. It's a good tool because it's a combination of plate and nailing, which I always like the, the combination. I would, I mean, you need a big block distally to do retrograde nailing. I like nailing, but the distal fragment should be big enough to have three interlocking bolts. That So the segment must be big enough. And then be careful if you have a young patient. I mean, you don't want to go through the knee joint. That's always a big, um, a big um, compromise, especially if you anticipate to remove the implant. Implant removal of an IM nail, a retrograde IM nail, is a disaster. It's difficult to get it out, to insert the uh, this distraction um, uh, hook. And so in young patients where you want to do an uh, implant removal, I would prefer the plating. Thank you. Uh, probably I take a couple minutes more uh, to, the, to discuss further questions. Do we have some, some questions, Mark, or... Or if not, I would ha I have a couple of questions. Chris Fung, um, very short question. So regarding yes, your, um, regarding your, your management of, uh, of tibia fractures, do you have like a special um, strategies to prevent infections? So do you do always antib give antibiotics? And in which open fractures do you do early fixation? Okay, um, so I think the general principle of infection, antibiotics, no brainer. Early closure. So when er, when we close the wound, we try to uh, even close off um, doubtful skin tissue. So even if the skin tissue edge is not good viability, we still try to close it. And the way closing it is we do it subcuticularly. So we do not put skin sutures on the skin. It, it preserves the edge of the skin. So when we come back later, the edge is well preserved and we can do something else uh, later on. Um, so there's evidence. And I think a low covancomycin powder sprinkling, some surgeons do not believe it, but I think the evidence is coming out that there is a 3% reduction in the uh, infection rate, according to a paper published by uh, JAMA Surgery in uh, it's around two years ago, the Vanco trial. So we are doing it that routinely, vancomycin powder. Uh, things like uh, antibiotic coated nails, it's not available in Hong Kong, unfortunately. Maybe you have experience, but um, those are the things where we uh, find useful in preventing infection. Oh, last but not least, I think liberal use of the back dressing is very useful. But in general, uh, we do not really have to delay the surgery too much, uh, unlike before, external fixator for two weeks. I think um, in most cases, unless those are with severe swelling, I find that uh, early nailing is really the way to go for, it. and the, the the chance of infection is low. So avoid plating, use more nailing. I think that's also a good way. So I think uh, we have no further questions. So if everybody agrees, I would like to close this webinar. I, so, Roman, I, yes. I, see a, I see a question yeah, in, in, the, in the chat. What okay. is your preferred mode of locking plate fixation distal femoral fractures, long working length or short working length plate? Uh, yes. Please. So always use long plate. But if you talk about the working length um, in a distal shaft fracture, the working length should always be two to two and a half the size of the, um, the 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 broad the the the, the uh, size of the cortical bone, so that should be the working length two to three times of the broad of the uh, cortical bone. So thank you very much. So um, uh, thank you very much. So. Um, uh, I would like to thank all speakers, Professor Hiroitsa, thank you very much for your principles. We all uh, learned a lot 
um, uh, Chris Funk for your inno innovative uh, ideas and innovative uh, um, cases that you have showed us. And also um, Dr. Davendra for your very, very interesting um, techniques, I would say this is transplantation of bone segments to treat severe defects. It was for me, it's very something new and I think and we need to know about it as a society. And I would like to thank for your for your time and for your for your effort to be with us. And um, I hope you like this uh, webinar and see you next time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you very much. Bye bye.